time for us to check back in with the people and their quilts and see what John discusses next in the book. If you've missed any of the previous readings, just look in the description below for a playlist. I'm going to read a little bit, and then I'm going to change the angle of the camera so that you can see into the book because the next several pages actually shows a lot of quilts. Um, has some little information to go along with them that I'll read, but that way you can see what I'm seeing. Quilt Types and Patterns it is commonly stated that there are two basic types of quilts, the piece and the applique, but this simplistic definition gets to be somewhat confusing. Some quilts include both the piece and the applique technique, and some so-called quilts, such as the tacked quilt or comforter, have neither. There are also numerous subtypes. It is generally accepted that the common practice of using bits and pieces of used clothing or scraps from the making of new clothing gave rise to the name patchwork. The fact that the pieces were sewn together to form the quilt top classifies it as a pieced quilt. Since clothing was much scarcer in colonial America than in the European countries, it is only natural that this practice of using scrap material was given new impetus here. So much so that some assumed this technique was initiated in America. But as noted in Chapter 1, the patchwork quilt, while popularized in America, is known to have existed in various European countries long before it gained popularity here. The following quilt patterns and quilt types were selected at random and are not necessarily the best known or most popular. Here, examples of striking, beautiful, and expertly made quilts appear along with dull, worn, ragged, and poorly made quilts. The patterns are identified by whatever name the maker or owner used because the local name should be recorded. In many cases, the more common or proper name is also provided. Identical or similar patterns may have several names. The names of quilt patterns are both interesting and informative about the people, their culture, and even their sense of humor. Religious names such as Garden of Eden, Job's Tears, Crown and Thorns, David and Goliath, and Tents of Armageddon are expressive and poetical. Frontier-inspired names like the Double-Bitted Axe, Log Cabin, Sawtooth, The Anvil, Bear's Paw, Barn Raisin, Churn Dash, and Indian Hatchet are reminders to us of the commonplace scenes of our great-grandmothers. Their historic names such as Burgoyne's Surrender, Lincoln's Platform, Courthouse Squire, Nelson's Victory, King's Crown, and Sherman's March. There are colorful names like Arkansas Traveler, Drunkard's Path, Attic Window, Aunt Dinah's Delight, Cat's Cradle, Broken Dishes, and Old Maid's Puzzle. Then there are names reminiscent of the old countries, Irish Chain, Dreadsome Plate, Dutch Mill, French Bouquet, and London Road. In many cases, there is a direct relationship between the quilt pattern and the name. Grandmother's Flower Garden, for example, one can look at this quilt and immediately equate the name with the pattern. Some, such as the Drunkard's Path, requires more imagination. Some quilt names, such as Rob Peter to Pay Paul, have little to do with the actual pattern. Elizabeth Welsh's Bridal Quilt This most unusual bridal album quilt was made in 1872 in Charleston, West Virginia as a wedding present for Elizabeth Welsh. It contains 56 blocks made by 25 of Elizabeth's friends and relatives. Each of the 25 contributors signed her name in India ink. One of the signatures was that of Elizabeth B. Welsh, the 90-year-old grandmother of the bride. Most of the blocks are also dated. Allison Arnold, who owns the quilt, points out that it contains most of the techniques used in quilting. They include piecing, applique, reverse applique, trap and two, quilting, and embroidery. The patterns were based on paper cutouts, and most of them are believed to be original designs. A friendship quilt was made for Grandpa Rice about 1888 by unmarried girls in Big Valley, Union County, Tennessee. 
The girls spent a good deal of their spare time making quilts for the unmarried but eligible young men in the community. Each girl would make a square, embroidery her name upon it, and incorporate it into a quilt. Over a period of time, they had made a number of these quilts, enough, it was said, for every young man in the immediate area except for Marcellus Moss Rice. He was younger than the other boys and not quite old enough for marriage. The girls may have been concentrating on the more marriageable men. The young men who had received their quilts noted that Grandpa had not gotten one and made fun of him because the girls had ostensibly left him out. When the girls learned that Marcellus was being ridiculed, they got busy and made him not just one, but two friendship quilts. The second one, no doubt, as an admonishment to the other boys who had thoughtlessly embarrassed him. He cared for them through the years and eventually gave one to each of his two daughters, Ruby Rice Little and Ruth Rice Irwin. The making of friendship quilts was quite common in most areas of Southern Appalachia, as well as throughout the country. This all-pieced quilt, measuring 81 inches by 60 inches, with squares set on the diamond, has been called the lily pattern and is generally called tulip in vase. Although there are three tulips in each vase, the singular form is used. The Best of Show This adaptation of the Rose of Sharon pattern was made in the Civil War period by a member of the John Blair family who came from Charleston, South Carolina to settle near the historic town of Kingston, Roan County, Tennessee. John Blair was a tanner and owned 350 acres of land upon which his tanning and farming operations were conducted. The original home place contains only three of the 36 original log buildings once used as the smokehouse, buggy house, cribs, barns, loom, house, tannery, hen house, workshop, granary, dwelling house, etc. Apparently, this had been a very prosperous homestead, a place where one would expect to find a fine quilt such as this. The quilt may have been made by John's wife, Mary Johnson Blair, who was born 1813, or possibly by one of their daughters, Mary Ann, Elizabeth Jane, Susan Caroline, or Nancy. The Blair sisters were noted for their dexterity in spinning, weaving, and sewing. Mary Johnson Browning inherited the quilt and recently entered it in the old quilt category at the Museum of Appalachia Quilt Show where it was awarded Best of Show. Della McNeil's Friendship Quilt, The Friendship Ring. The traditional story behind this quilt reveals that Della McNeil from the Fentress Overton County section of Tennessee decided to make a quilt for a crippled boy in the community. Various women in the area volunteered to each make a square, and they subsequently placed their initials on their respective squares. The quilt was presented to the bedridden youngster when it was completed, but because it was so colorful and pretty, he was never allowed to use it. It was kept packed away so that it would not be soiled or damaged. This quilt, called the Friendship Ring, measures 72 inches by 72. Jamestown, Kansas Friendship Quilt Andrea Fritz left and Margaret Heaton hold a friendship or album quilt made in 1870 for Margaret's grandmother, Gray, of Jamestown, Kansas. Margaret recalls that each block was made and signed by a member of the Methodist Church. The various appliqued patterns were dyed. Margaret had been told with turkey red dye. Apparently, some of the women were not too adept at dyeing, or perhaps the dye was faulty because some of the blocks have faded appreciably. Grandmother's Kansas Flower Garden Made on the plains of Kansas in Cloud County by Olive Gray, this grandmother's flower garden has an irregular border which varies from the sides to the ends. It was pieced from scraps left from the making of dresses, aprons, etc. The Bear's Paw Friendship Quilt with Deliberate Flaws Why did Sari Turner's Bear Paw have blue toes, and why were the toes on Elizabeth Harrell's Bear Paw turned backward? These and other mysteries make this friendship quilt an interesting one. The quilt was made in the Alder Springs section of Union County, Tennessee, and contains 20 squares. 
19 of the squares contain women's names, since only one man's name appears, that of Henry Lee Turner, one wonders if the quilt was not made for him. However, there are four double hearts in each square, one pair in each corner, and this may indicate that it was a wedding quilt for one of the girls. The speculation is that the girl for whom it was intended was Augusta E. Turner, since hers was the only square that was dated. Four of the squares are blue, apparently dyed with indigo. These squares are signed respectively by Sarah Turner Johnson and her three daughters, Gertrude, Lodina, and Nola. Sarah's husband, George, was the youngest brother of Hannah Johnson Wyrick, who was the great-great-grandmother of Naimuni Young, who now owns the quilt. She is shown holding it. Naimuni bought the quilt at public auction at Halls Cross Roads, only a few miles from Alder Springs, where it was made 100 years previously. The 16 brown squares are believed to have been dyed with walnut hulls. The square made by Elizabeth Harrell has the toes turned backward. The squares with the patterns are pieced, and the white squares contain a beautiful quilted pattern of feathered wreaths, as well as the double hearts in each corner. How does one explain the blue toes and the backward toes? There was a common belief adhered to by many that to make a quilt too fancy and too perfect would be to tempt God. The Bible clearly points out our imperfection to ensure that everyone knew he was imperfect. Quilters sometimes deliberately created a flaw such as the blue toes and the backward toes. Baltimore Album Quilt this album quilt, which Mildred Locke uses as a wall hanging periodically, came from an old Tennessee home, but was doubtless made in Baltimore. Mildred Locke and her quilts are discussed extensively in chapter eight. It is signed and dated in several places, and one inscription in the lower right-hand corner reads, Julia Ann Pence, Pitt Street, Baltimore City, 1847. Mildred points out that no two blocks on the quilt are alike, and the workmanship shows at least five different makers. It is believed to be a presentation gift for a man because several of the blocks have men's names in them. On the trunk in the corner are two antique quilts, a crazy quilt, and a log cabin quilt, both made of silks and velvets. On the rocker is a basket quilt made in Kentucky around 1880 album quilt. During the mid-1800s, the album quilt gained widespread popularity in many parts of the country. It consisted of a series of squares, each made by a different member of the family or community. These squares were then sewn together to form the quilt top, and quilting was done in the usual fashion. Presumably, the term album quilt is derived from the fact that various women contributed a portion and because the respective squares often represented some place, event, or object. Remembrance and autograph albums were also popular during the 19th century when the album quilt was gaining popularity. Many authorities use the terms album quilt and friendship quilt interchangeably, but it seems that friendship and autograph ought to be reserved for quilts where blocks are signed by different quilters. The so-called Baltimore album quilts are the most popular and sought after after this type. The development of these well-known, exquisitely made quilts is credited to a group of Methodist women who were active in Baltimore, Maryland in the 1840s. Overall Tack Quilt even if Uncle Jake's overalls were worn threadbare in the seat and knees, there were always a few areas where the cloth was strong enough to make quilt pieces. The lower part of the legs, perhaps, and especially underneath the pocket covers. Close observation of the top portion of this quilt reveals the outline of the hip pocket from a pair of overalls. The inner lining of this comforter or tack quilt consists of an old woolen blanket. The overalls accompanying the quilt are the type used in making the quilt. One might think that quilts of this type would be relatively common in the southern Appalachian region where most of the rural men wore overalls, but such is not the case. Only a few have been encountered. This one has a few wool patches and was acquired from the old Rufus and Kelly Eldridge place near Bear Wallow Mountain in Sevier County, Tennessee. It measures 78 inches by 63 inches. The Comforter or Tack Quilt. 
In showing her quilts, most any lady of the house will bring out the colorful pieced quilts which once belonged to her grandmother, the beautiful appliqued ones, and the Victorian crazy quilts. Sometimes, if you insist that you would like to see all her quilts, she will bring out the utility patchwork quilts made from dress scraps. She will almost never hand over the heavy comforter or tacked quilt. As a matter of fact, they are usually stacked and stored separately from the other quilts, as if she doesn't want them to be associated with her good quilts. As has been mentioned earlier, the comforter is not a quilt in the technical sense since it is tied or tacked instead of being quilted. The ties occur only every few inches and do not keep the cotton feeling from migrating and becoming bunched up. Many comforters had feelings of worn out quilts, coverlets, and scraps of heavy cloth and were so thick and heavy they could not have been quilted even if time had permitted. The tendency to ignore this type of quilt is understandable for it can hardly be classified as beautiful or even attractive. Most books on the subject of quilting ignore them altogether. However, from the standpoint of popularity and use, this type of bed covering was one of the most common. This was especially true in pioneer times and in poorer homes of a later period. With a half dozen beds, each requiring four to eight quilts, the women of the house could ill afford to spend their time worrying about the appearance of the bed coverings. One could make several tack quilts in the time it takes to make an expertly quilted one. Opal Hatmaker, whose interview is included in another chapter, stated that she, her sister, and her mother could tack a comforter in two or three hours, whereas it would have taken several days for them to quilt it. Most of the older women with whom we talked learned to sew as small children, helping their mothers make comforters. When the family was no longer expanding and they had made enough everyday quilts, the mother, with the help of the girls, often started making more pieced and even applique quilts. Very often when a girl of limited means married, she would have to revert back to the tack quilt or pieced quilts made from old woolen or colorless clothes. Under more prosperous circumstances, the young bride would be given beautiful applique quilts as part of her dowry. In some cases, the bride would have a hope chest which included several quilts. More of the old tact comforters were made in the growing up years of our country than is generally recognized. There are not many shown from this period today for several reasons. First, as noted above, they are seldom displayed. Second, these were used on a daily basis and over a period of many years, even those sturdy articles eventually wore out. The word comforter in some sections of the country refers to a thick bed covering filled with feathers, straw, corn shucks, etc. In the areas we investigated, such items are called feather beds, straw ticks, etc., and not comforters. The trapunto or stuffed quilt. Trapunto is the name applied to quilting with designs stuffed or padded to create a high relief or three-dimensional effect. Researchers say this practice probably originated in the 1400s in Sicily, where expert needlework has long been practiced. The art of trapunto was practiced in other European countries as well and was apparently brought to America by early colonists, but these stuffed quilts were not nearly as well known here as were the other techniques. In the classic way of making a trapunto or stuffed quilt, the cotton or wool was inserted from the back of the quilt by means of separating the threads and forming a tiny opening. After the stuffing had been inserted into the design, the threads were returned to their natural position. The few I found in the southern Appalachian region were made in a different manner, according to family members. If they were appliquing a grape, for example, they would leave a half-inch area unsewn. Then they would push their stuffing through this opening to create the raised design and finish sewing or appliquing the grape design on the quilt. In some cases, they merely placed a wad of cotton on the quilt top, placed the designed fabric over the top of the cotton, tacked it temporarily to hold it secure, and then attached the appliqued piece. Rose of Sharon, the watermelon quilt with Trapunto. Beverly Burbage, a retired lawyer from the Tennessee Valley Authority, owns this beautiful quilt. Although Beverly is an authority on several categories of antiques, he makes no pretense to be an authority on quilts. 
He called this his watermelon quilt because of what appeared to be slices of red ripe watermelons which make up the quilt's border. It is appliqued and has trapunto work or stuffing in the border. Beverly purchased it in the 1930s from an old German family, the Bargers, whose family adjoined Beverly's father's farm in the Hillcrest community, Sullivan County in Upper East Tennessee. Beverly recalls the elder saying that it was hand dyed and that it was made by Maria Barger, whose initials appear on the back. It is believed to have been made in the mid 1800s. The direct route from this area of Tennessee up the valley of Virginia and into Pennsylvania probably explains what some consider to be Pennsylvania characteristics. The Crazy Quilt. The Crazy Quilt was one of the types commonly used in 19th century America. Cloth was extremely scarce, so every tiny and irregular scrap was saved. In order to gain the maximum use of the available cloth, these variously shaped pieces were simply sewn together. The pattern was jagged, highly irregular, and crazy looking. During the late 1800s, Americans adopted more colorful, ornate, and decorative styles. Houses, furniture, picture frames, and many other articles produced during this time were ornate, sometimes to the point of gaudiness. Frontier conditions were passing. The country was recovering from the devastation of the Civil War, and industrialization was expanding at a rapid rate. While the people were gaining more leisure time, they no longer had to think strictly in drab, utilitarian terms, but could spend time on the freely, the fancy, and the colorful. This philosophy was incorporated into every aspect of their lives, including their quilts. Hence, the fad of the Victorian crazy quilt developed. It was essentially the same type as the Pioneer article, except that now they were made of expensive textiles with bright and varied colors. The crazy quilt was occasionally used as a bed covering on Sunday and was even used in the parlor. It was sometimes called a couch throw or a slumber robe. In addition to being characterized by bright colors and odd-shaped pieces of silk, velvet, and other fine cloth, the Victorian crazy quilt usually included fancy and ornate stitching used such techniques as herringbone, buttonhole, French knot, loops, and diamonds, and feather stitching. Odd and unusual materials were often included. For example, some crazy quilts were made totally or in part from such items as campaign ribbons, silk shoe labels, labels from garments, etc. Some observers feel the advent of the Victorian crazy quilt marked the end of the beautiful, minutely pieced and appliqued quilts of the previous years called by some the glorious period of quilting. They see the brightly colored crazy quilt as a degenerate, gaudy form and have little or no respect for it. Others feel this type of quilt represents a very important mood and art form in our country's history and should be as carefully collected, studied, and preserved as the other types. Beauty, they would say, is in the eye of the beholder. Granny Irwin's Crazy Quilt and Matchin Pillow Shams This Victorian crazy quilt was made by Sarah Jane Stooksbury Irwin of Union County, Tennessee. Her initials, SJS, are evidence that the quilt was made before she married in the 1890s. Several other names and initials appearing on the quilt are likely indicators that this quilt was the result of a joint effort. Maybe we should call it an autograph, friendship, silk and satin, Victorian crazy quilt. The match and pillow shams were never completed, an indication that the quilt itself may never have been used. Granny Irwin's baby quilt, along with the completed crazy quilt found in a cedar chest at the old Kennedy place, there were 24 completed crazy squares which had never been sewn together, as well as various other squares that were never made into a quilt. The Dutch doll baby quilt was made by my grandmother, Sarah Jane Irwin, and was passed around for use by her several grandchildren, including the writer. It was last used by my cousin Tommy Irwin, her youngest grandchild. It was to him that she gave the quilt, photographed at the Museum of Appalachia. The Crazy Crazy Quilt One would be hard-pressed to find a crazier Victorian quilt than this one. Its composition includes the usual silk and satin pieces, plus clothing labels and campaign ribbons and portions of men's neckties. The symbols include scissors, hearts, a good luck horseshoe, and dozens of various types of flowers. 
It is signed, presumably by its maker, Lucy Knapp, age 77, 1887. The James G. Blaine Presidential Campaign Ribbon, the day and the signature of the quilt maker provided a rare documentation as to the age of this quilt. The applique quilt. The word applique is of French derivation and means to apply or lay on. Rather than sewing similar or variously shaped pieces together to form the quilt top, as in the case of the pieced quilt, the pattern of the applique quilt is sewn onto an existing top. The pieced quilt pattern tends to be designed in geometric forms, while applique quilts have more varied motives. There are floral, garden, fruit, and bird motifs, to mention a few. The applique quilt became popular in most areas of the country in the mid-1800s and is characterized by its rich colors and beautiful designs. Many were made as showpieces, as gifts, and as heirlooms, rather than for everyday use. A surprisingly large number remain in pristine condition. As will be noted from the following examples, the style, designs, motifs, and color combinations vary wildly. Wild Rose Betty and Jack McDowell are shown at their home near Oak Ridge, Tennessee, with the Wild Rose quilt made by Jack's great aunt Mahala Rasco of White County, Tennessee. Mahala, who never married, 1817 to 1907, made this quilt in the late 1800s. It is appliqued and has a trapunto or stuffed vine and grapes design on the two sides. Chapman Family Quilt. This fine quilt came from one of the Knox County, Tennessee's early and prominent families, the Chapmans. It is appliqued and is presumed to have been made by some of the Chapman women, probably in the late 1800s, collection of Joan Self, Knoxville. Sweetwater Valley Quilt. One would expect to find a striking quilt such as this in the beautiful and historic Sweetwater Valley, which lies between Knoxville and Chattanooga, Tennessee. The applique pattern is somewhat similar to one version of Rose of Sharon, and the finely executed quilting design is of vases and flowers with vines meandering throughout. It is owned by Naimuni Young, shown here with her husband, Harvey. This California rose quilt was made in Sweetwater Valley, one of East Tennessee's widest and most fertile valleys. The quilt was made near the town of Sweetwater, some 50 miles southwest of Knoxville, collection of Jones Self, Knoxville. Sunburst and Ribbon. Lula Mae McDowell Stubblefield, who made this beautiful blue sunburst and ribbon quilt, won first place with it at the Tennessee State Fair in Nashville in 1963. Lula May's aunt Mahala, who made the wild rose quilt shown above, lived with Lula May and her husband for many years and inspired her to appreciate quilts and quilting. This pieced and applique quilt was made in the 1950s near the middle Tennessee town of Sparta. Lula May was the aunt of Jack McDowell, shown holding the quilt with his wife, Betty. Pine Tree and Mexican Rose in the spring, in years past, a common sight throughout southern Appalachia was of colorful and beautiful quilts sunning beside unpainted log cabins. Here at the old Parker house, the quilts were placed on the rail fence, especially to be photographed, but it is a scene that has been encountered naturally many times. The quilt on the right has the pine trees pattern, considered to be one of the very oldest in America. It features very close quilting and is from Jefferson County, near where the Parker Log House originally stood. The house is now located at the Museum of Appalachia. The quilt at left is appliqued and originated in Knox County, Tennessee. The pattern is a variation of Mexican rose and the high relief of the floral quilting complements the bold color of the applied pattern. This quilt was displayed at the 1982 World's Fair in Knoxville where people from all over the world admired it. Both quilts date from the last quarter of the 19th century. The Rose Quilt this applique quilt, called simply the Rose Quilt, was made by Ruth Rice Irwin in the early 1930s. When asked if she ever used this and a few other colorful and closely quilted ones which she made, she replied, Oh no, I made several everyday quilts that we used, but we never used this one or the other nicer ones. It measures 76 inches by 72. The Nell Thomas Rains Quilt. 
When Jeanette Galloway of Lake City, Tennessee learned that information was being gathered on quilts, she offered to share with us one she cherishes very much. It was made by Nell Thomas Rains here in Lake City. She'd be way over a hundred years old if she was still living. She was Dr. Cox's nurse for years and years. She made quilts for her family and for all her grandchildren. She was a very special friend of mine and she gave me this quilt that she made back in the early 1900s, before 1910, I think. She wanted me to have it and I've cared for it all these years. It was appliqued and rather minutely quilted in the wind-blown tulips pattern rose tree, prairie flower, or Missouri rose. Mary, Ginger Newsel is justifiably proud of this quilt made by her great-great-grandmother, Betsy Hardaway Vertries, in the bluegrass section of Kentucky, a few miles south of Lexington. According to family tradition, the quilt was made in 1850 and was given to Betsy's granddaughter, Mabel Caldwell Shipley. She in turn gave it to her granddaughter, Mary Ginger Gambrel Newsel. Ginger's sister was more dexterous with a needle and at the time more interested in quilts, but Grandma Vertries decided not to give the quilt to her because she had a dog which was allowed to come into the house and occasionally hop onto the bed. Ironically now, Ginger has six dogs which sometimes come into her modern home. Betsy Vertris undoubtedly labored under primitive conditions to create this object of beauty worthy of our admiration. It is pieced and appliqued and is extraordinarily large for the time, measuring 85 inches by 95. The back is hand spun and hand woven from cotton, which was according to family oral tradition, grown, picked, seeded, and processed by Betsy Vertris. The Hawaiian Applique Jenny Snyder moved many times with her husband during his military career, and the only place they stayed long enough for her to make a quilt, Jenny says, was Hawaii. It was there that she observed the unusual applique technique which she employed in making her own design for this quilt. Jenny was awarded a blue ribbon for the best applique quilt in the 1983 Museum of Appalachia Quilt Show. Dutch Doll Few patterns were more popular than the Dutch doll, perhaps because of the early Dutch influence on American quilting. This one was made by Ruth Rice Irwin as a young girl living with her parents on Bull Run Creek in Knox County, Tennessee, about 1922. It is pieced and appliqued, has embroidery on the bonnets, and measures 68 inches by 86 inches. Our dog, Freddie, has no connection whatever with the quilt. Granny Rice's Feathered Star and Grandmother Rice's Star in Star. Ruth Rice Irwin holds a type of feathered star her mother, Ibby Weaver Rice, made about the time she started housekeeping in 1904 in Knox County, Tennessee. Granny was the eldest of 16 children and helped manage the affairs of the family at an early age since her father was often away from home in connection with his duties as a primitive Baptist preacher. The quilt in the background was made by Ruth Irwin's grandmother, Sarah, Sally, Longmire Rice, the daughter of a prominent farmer, Robert Longmire. They lived in Big Valley, Union County, Tennessee. Sally married Henry Rice, who operated the well-known Rice water-powered corn mill in Big Valley. This quilt has a star in star pattern. Both quilts are pieced. This, the largest old quilt that the writer has encountered, is slightly over nine feet square. It belongs to Mark King at left, who acquired it from his mother, Mary Kate Farthing King, who in turn inherited it from her mother, whose maiden name was Lowry. She reportedly made the quilt about 1850 at the Lowry home in the Holston Valley section of Sullivan County, Tennessee, near where the state joins Virginia and North Carolina. Mark stated that it was used very sparingly through the years as a bedspread for special occasions or for special company. He, like other quilt connoisseurs, is at a loss as to why it was made so large, many years before the advent of queen and king size beds. It is all pieced and has very close stitching. The pattern, according to Mark, is Tennessee Beauty, more commonly called New York Beauty, the beauty at right helping hold the quilt is Brian Cullity, Mark's friend and fellow antique trader.
when Bernice Hensley, the quilting widow from Indian Fork of Unicoi County, Tennessee, pulled a quilt from her upstairs quilt chest, I immediately was struck with the fact that it was the same pattern as the large quilt belonging to Mark King. This one was made on the Priest River in Idaho by Bernice Hensley's grandmother. I soon learned, however, that her grandmother was a native of the same area in Sullivan County, Tennessee, where the King quilt originated. She migrated to Idaho, and she made this quilt for Daddy, Levi Hensley. She died out there, and my Daddy come back to Tennessee, and he brought this quilt with him. They called it the Bristol Beauty and the Tennessee Beauty. I reckon since it was made in Idaho, it could be called the Idaho Beauty. The pattern is more commonly called the New York Beauty. Ida Turner George's Quilt Ida Turner George always made and kept a few extra quilts on hand for Christmas presents and especially for wedding presents for her grandchildren. The one shown here was made at her home in Union County, Tennessee and presented to her granddaughter, Willie Stooksbury, when she married Morel Irwin. This fancy dredson play is pieced and appliqued and measures 57 inches by 72. Kate Stooksbury Double Wedding Ring Quilt Kate George Stooksbury, the daughter of Ida George, always raised a patch of cotton for making quilts, according to her daughter, Willie. As a child in the late 1930s, I remember going to her house with my family and several neighbors to celebrate the coming of the new year. As we waited for the midnight hour, we seeded Kate's homegrown cotton, which was spread in front of the open fire. The seeds had to be warm before they could be picked from the tenacious fibers. This popular double wedding ring quilt was made by Kate about the same time as the New Year's Eve party in the late 1930s. The home of Lawrence and Kate Stooksbury was in a rural area at the time, but is now the site of the city of Oak Ridge, Tennessee. The quilt lining was made from feed sacks and the trademark is still visible. 100 pounds net, 16% Wesco Dairy Feed. Carolina Lily with Deliberate Flaw. Close observation of the second square from the bottom on the left side of this quilt will reveal the intentional mistake explained in connection with the Bear Paws Friendship Quilt. The stem is not connected to the flower in this square, but it is properly connected on all other squares. This Carolina Lily quilt was purchased by Namuni Young at the public auction sale of Dan and Bertha Woods Estate in the Gibbs community of North Knox County, Tennessee. It was made between 1890 and 1900, shown holding the quilt with Nay Mooney as her husband, Harvey. And of course we see that must just be a typo. There's no one there with them in that picture. The broken or open star quilt, once bordered quilt. An unusual feature of this quilt is that it has only one border, which upon serious consideration makes a good bit of sense. When used on a bed with a solid headboard and a solid footboard, neither the top nor the bottom of the quilt can be seen. If the bed is positioned against a wall, as it was often the case, then the border of the quilt would not show on the wall side. One border was all that was needed. Why go to all the work to add the other three? The broken or open star quilt was made by a member of the Kane family, an early and prominent family from the fashionable Kingston Pike section of Knoxville, Tennessee. It bears the letters RC on the back, presumably the initials of one of the Kane ladies in the late 1800s. So many interesting things in the, the part that we've read today. All those beautiful, beautiful quilts. Um, one thing that immediately I'm going to flip through while I, I didn't jot down my usual notes, so I'm just going to look through to remind myself. But one thing I really love, um, and I'm not a quilter again, but I am amazed by all those patterns. And I really love the one that we read where the lady from out in Idaho made the quilt that was like the quilt that he had found in Tennessee. And then they found out that that's where that her family had come from. You know, really fascinating to think about how those and really precious to think about how those people that were quilters in those days that loved them, you can just see them like if they, you know, somebody moved into their community, maybe they would share their, oh, I learned this, oh, we do this, and sharing those patterns and then seeing them get all excited about it. 
Um, reminds me, of course, there's lots of different art forms that are like that, or even recipes and things you think about like that. House building, all kinds of things you could say, you know, exciting how the styles of one area then morph to another, or, you know, when people moved around, how that moved with them. Uh, reminds me of music is what I was going to say. But I really love that part and love thinking about the... Um, the camaraderie and then the excitement that they they had when they shared those patterns and then also when they when a pattern become really popular in an area how i'm sure some people put their own little spin on it you know and how it'd be like oh she did that but she done this other so i really really loved that part and then the other one i loved was the the quilt with the friendship quilt with the bare toes being wrong being um, done wrong you know and then the other quilt with the lilies now, um, and then, you know, I like his explanation. You can see those people thought, well, we can't make it perfect because, you know, no one's perfect but God or Jesus. If you're a believer, you know, you believe that with all your heart. But it's interesting how they how they did that on purpose. And I, I like thinking about their thought process, but also how they um, how they felt about that. So I thought that was, both of those was really, really neat. And then just some of the quilt, they're all so beautiful, all the quilts. Uh, the Elizabeth Welsh's bridal quilt, that was one of the prettiest ones, I thought. Um, and it was 1872 as an old one. But then the, you know, the those crazy quilts were so beautiful. I loved the friendship ring, one from Tennessee, uh, the stars and the, the red, uh, my light's shining on it, but that one. Um, and then the story, you know, that it was it was given to the little boy, but then he didn't get to use it much. But that one was really pretty. It was interesting, the one where the colors had faded. Maybe the women, some women used a different kind of dye. I, I wondered about that one. I like the one that was the grandmother's flower garden where it had irregular edges. Some of Granny's crocheted pieces are like that, have that irregular uh, edge instead of just a straight one. Um, so many, so many pretty ones, though. I love the a little piece of where we read about the comforters and the tack quilts. Now, those are the really the quilts that I like. I don't know. I like because, and I've got some of them that Granny made. Really, base, a lot of Grannies were more utilitarian, but those are the ones I'm drawn to. I love thinking about the pieces of fabric, if that was. And the crazy quilts are kind of like that, too. Um, but those pieced quilts that are just simple out of fabric pieces thinking about who wore that you know was that a dress was that an apron was that somebody's shirt i love that and the overall one the tack quilt i really love that i, I think you know then it would be all clean and nice but then you'd also know you're sleeping under it uh, what had you know been in the garden and done the work for the family i, I just love those connections and then i did i had no clue about this word i've learned this trapunto trapunto was those stuffed quilts when i I had no clue that that's what it was called. But I have seen Granny do that on some of her quilts where she stuck the batting in there to make it make it a raised up area. And it also reminds me, I've got, I give it to Corey now, she's got it. But when I was a little girl, there was a, a picture that Granny made that hung in our, in our house, you know. And then after I was married, Granny gave it to me and it hung in my house for a long time. And then Corey had it in her room and I give it to her when she uh, got married and left. But it's a piece of fabric, and then you they would glue it on them. It was just, Granny said it was the rage at one time. You know, it's just the popular thing to do. Glue it on a, a board or something. Uh, but before that, or maybe it's on a piece of fabric, but you stuffed it. You stuffed some of it. It was a printed fabric, so the one I have is horses, or that Corey has that was Granny's. And so she stuffed stuffing into some of the horses, so they stood up from the fabric. And then you put it in a picture frame and hang it on the picture on the wall so that really reminded me of that and i know that's where that come from uh, all those you know it's just fascinating to see how a, a technique like that morphs and changes over the years and and used for different things those crazy quilts were beautiful i love the the story of the baby quilt from his family and how you know finally Ta his cousin tommy got it um, then there was the funny one where the woman gave the quilt not to the dot to the daughter that really, really loved quilting, but to the other one because the one that liked quilting had dogs and she didn't want dogs on her quilts. So that was kind of funny. Those crazy quilts were just amazing, especially the Lucy Knapp, age 77, 1887. That one was amazing. And then just, I mean, all of them are beautiful. But there was one more I wanted to, to mention. 
oh, the Dutch doll. So I am going to do a video and show my quilts and then show some of the, unless I, if I give that to Corey or Katie, Corey, I'll get it back from her. But I do have a couple of quilt tops that Matt's great grandmother made that are not quilted. They're just the tops. And one of them is the Dutch girl. Um, really beautiful and I should have it quilted I should do that I can't do it myself but I should pay somebody to do it I know it would be be well worth it so um, I am going to do a, a, a my quilts are not fancy like these or anything they're just special to me because of you know different people where they come from but I am going to uh, am going to show them to you in another video not a weekly reading but just in a different video and I really love I love stars are my favorite shape so those two the Granny Rice's Feathered Star and the Grandmother's Rice's Star in Star. Mm, those were really, really beautiful. So, so many. Uh, and then that giant quilt was really interesting. Makes you wonder why it was that big. Now, if I if I made something like that and it turned out to be that big, what would be me is that I messed up somewhere else. Like, I didn't realize how much fabric I had and then it just ended up that um, so that makes me wonder if that's what happened there. Probably not. It was probably somebody that knew exactly what they were doing. But for me, sometimes if something ends up wonky like that or different than it should be, it's because I didn't really know what I was doing. And I just had to go as I went. I just had to, to make it happen. I hope you enjoyed seeing all those beautiful quilts. I hope you'll leave a comment let me know what jumped out at you. And, of course, I hope you'll drop back by next week so we can see... Uh, what John talks about next, and there's several more pages of just showing the quilt, so I'll be sure to share those too.